Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm so happy to be with you as always. Um, Ray Angelo does such a wonderful uh, job in providing such support so that we can all share together and enjoy, uh, hopefully enjoy the presentation today because it's a little bit different. Uh, when COVID first started in February, March, um, I was really trying to, at that time, since we couldn't gather and we didn't really know what was happening, I uh, spent some time um, you know, adding some new programs that I thought would be of interest. And um, I did several on my usual health and wellness, but then I started to think to myself, you know, look at what we're going through in March, April, um, all of the protests, all of the, the fact that we had to stay at home. Um, you saw things on television with people not wearing masks. And, you know, all we really were asking for were people to wear masks, uh, wash your hands, and distance six feet or more. And people didn't do it. And I started to think, why? You know, and I'm just so I, disbelief of people not, I'm such a rule follower. I guess it's because of my nursing background. But anyway, I was so shocked and surprised. And then all of a sudden I thought, well, I just, I remember I, I was um, born in 1943. So my brother and brother-in-law, I was the youngest in my family, uh, were in the war. Obviously I didn't know that because I was just born during the war. And I remember stories afterwards, but thinking about that and how my family and many families, everyone supported the war and without question, you know, without question. And uh, so then I thought, and we can't do it here now in uh, 2020. And we have all of the wonderful things that we can do, just follow those three rules. So that started me on this task to say, World War II, the role of the home front. And I hope you enjoy it. And um, if we have any uh, you know, post uh, army uh, soldiers in, in the audience or nurses in the audience that might have served or new family members that served, just uh, at the end, just let me know if you have any questions or what your thoughts are about the presentation. So here we go, World War II, the role of the home front. When the Japanese attacked on the American Navy fleet at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, December 7th, 1941, that really started um, our connection to the war. We knew we had to help. We knew we had to support that attack. So this attack initiated the role of American citizens played to support the war on the home front. Everyday life in America changed dramatically. I mean, overnight. There was not enough or adequate food. There were gas shortages, clothing was rationed. Everything was rationed because one, we needed supplies. Two, we didn't know how much we needed, where we needed it and when we needed it. But everyone tried their very best to support whatever the request was. Scrap metal drives supported efforts to build armaments necessary to win the war. Everyone that wasn't in the war was supporting their efforts. Rationing programs were imposed. There was limits on the amount of gas, food, and clothing. They were almost established overnight. Families were issued ration stamps to purchase meat, butter, sugar, vegetables, fruit, gas for cars, tires, clothing, and fuel oil. So this rationing affected, again, every part of your living, every part. And I do recall um, during that time, I don't recall, but I know I was told about this, they had um, uh, bags of, look, it looked like lard, and um, maybe the bag was about six inches long. And in the middle of this plastic bag was a little red button. And my mother used to say that she used to have to push that button hard, hard, hard over and over again to sort of get this thing that looked like white lard to look like butter. And she said, oh, she said, that's the only thing we had because of the rationing of the, of the butter. And that was, you know, they didn't care. It tasted like butter. It looked like butter. They had to work a little bit to get the yellow color. But people said they didn't care. They did anything to support that, uh, 
to support our soldiers. The war, war, the war changed our workforce. Tens of thousands of men joined the armed forces for training and battle. It was a given. But as a result, the workforce needed to change immediately and women answered the call. You know, in the 40s, it was, if you, know, if you had a family, it was generally in the 40s, you no know, husband, wife, children. And all of a sudden, their husbands, their brothers, their uncles, and the women that were wax, the, uh, na the nurses in the war, um, left, they left the country. So therefore, we really had to, had to help. So women found employment as electricians, welders, riveters in defense of plants. Rosie the Riveter became the name of women employed in the defense industry. You can't see it, but I have a picture um, on my right here. I think you could see it up here, but I have a picture on the slideshow too, uh, depicting Rosie the Riveter. And that's what they called all of the women that actually worked in the defense department. Victory Gardens. Victory Gardens became how people make, got that extra food. As a result of the rationing, citizens started to grow their own vegetables. The gardens became known as Victory Gardens. Now, isn't that just if you, that cliche, that feeling of we're in this war, we're in this war together and we need to help and we're gonna start some gardens because remember, they, they were rationing on, on uh, food products. So vegetables and flowers popped up in many cities all over the country. This was not regionalized. Everyone tried to support via the uh, Victory Gardens. They became not only a food source, but think about this. It brought so many citizens together. So there were Victory Gardens. You know, if you had, if you lived in the country, you had a Victory Garden because you needed those supplies. But if you lived in the city, there were parts of the city that just opened up and there were, you know, there were still at the time, there was space for uh, gardens to be everywhere and they grew these victory gardens. But guess what? While they were picking their plants, planting the food, there was somebody right next to them that can talk. They talk about, have you heard from your husband? Have you gotten any letters? Um, I'm so afraid or I've been going to church more. They talk and that socialization brought our country even closer together uh, than ever before. Movie theaters. Many theaters use the non-war dramas, a lot of comedies and westerns to escape the issues of the war. Note to self, there weren't any televisions or th there were no televisions. So people, they went to the movies, that was their recreation. So going to the movie theaters was part of their recreation in the past. Now during the war, it became their, their escape. The cost of attending a movie averaged 25 cents. It was affordable even in the day and worth every minute. Two, now probably they are up to $18. And if you re really want, you know, we're, since we, lots of us, we're still on this um, COVID-19, you don't go to movie theaters, they're, they're closed. So you try Netflix and Net Netflix, they're really, they're really saying, okay, we have a captive audience. And if you want sort of a more modern uh, movie or one that just came out, you could pay at least 20 to $25 for that movie. And again, people are cap capturing the fact that people wanna see something and they are willing to pay the 20 or $25. But again, it was 25 cents, I'm just adding that. Movies also focused on the trials of the war and people did attend out of interest and concern. Top actors joined the military, so new performers were introduced. Well, new performers without much talent, the new movies were really not good, but people still, still paid to go. It was something to do. Patriotic music and radio reports, that became very, very popular. Some of the popular song titles, The Last Time I Saw Paris, Boogie Woogie Bugle Boys, Praise the Lord and Pass the Ammunition, and Lily Marlene, which we will talk about a little bit later. Radio was a way to communicate with updates on the fighting overseas. Big bands and orchestras performed before thousands of military bases. And if you ever see 
um, any stories or you you just want to fool around on your computer and you go to World War II, you will see thousands of troops being entertained by these performers. They knew that they needed a place to sort of let go and relax. So big bands and orchestras really, really uh, helped in the movement. Entertainers and songs of the era. Well, we have Harry James, You Made Me Love You, Glenn Miller in the Mood and Moonlight Serenade, Duke Ellington, this great one, Take the A-Train. Andrew Sisters, I already mentioned, Boogie Boogie Bugle Boys, Doris Day, Sentimental Mental Journey, and Kitty Callan, it's been a long, long time. So movies for people back home and the radio, they were listening to songs all the time. They needed something to sort of take their mind off because no TVs, they did not have 24 seven news as we have. So newspapers and, and radios became um, their avenue to relax. Radio, people used to have these huge radios because that's what you did in the day. Instead of buying a, a 60 inch flat screen, you, they were buying, they bought used radios, at huge radios. So it really became a, a piece of furniture. So it was a large piece, uh, probably some of them would be about four feet tall, maybe three feet wide. And people gathered, just like you're watching television, they gathered around the radio at certain times of day. Again, they didn't have 24 radio either. So that was part of their entertainment, but it was such a link to what was happening in the war. Baseball and the battlefield. Well, baseball was like the biggest um, in the 40s, one of the biggest uh, sports entertainment. It was uh, baseball. So uh, there was no baseball. Why? All of the baseball players, they went to war. The commissioner of baseball, Kennesaw Landis, asked President Roosevelt if professional baseball should be suspended during war. So the connection here, commissioner of baseball goes directly to the president Roosevelt when he was you know, trying to deal with the war and asked about baseball, what should we do? We don't have great players because they went to the war, but it would be an avenue, but is it also disrespectful to be having some fun? And when Commissioner um, Kennesaw, when this was a written letter, this was known as the green light letter, although major league players went to war and the games were played by amateurs. President Roosevelt answered baseball, President Roosevelt answered baseball is good for the country's collective morale and diversion. So just think about in the day, what would be happening today if our men went overseas uh, and our men do go overseas, but not at the uh, magnitude that we had during World War II. So I thought that was also interesting to add. People were really concerned about what was happening at home and what things we should do. Is it showing disrespect if we were still playing games, even though the games were not great because we didn't have great baseball players during that time, they were serving uh, in the war, but they said, no, we, he wanted people to still have that thought that perhaps someday we'll all, our family will be together and we will be able to see a baseball game. Radio reports. Citizens relied on the radio as their source of news and entertainment. Everyone was gathered around the radio to listen to war updates. Legendary journalist Edward R. Murrow was famous for the most accurate reports. So if you wanted to listen to the radio and you wanted to find out about the war, you would tune in to Edward R. Murrow and his very famous voice. Other programs were storylines of fictional soldiers fighting in the war, a series that was produced by Norman Collins. Again, they wanted to lighten it up a little bit, so they tried different things on the radio. But again, radio, became, radio and the newspaper were the links. There were special music titles, which we talked a little bit about, but they really wanted to enjoy music. They had to, they had to lighten up because during the war, you know, they were, they were worried and concerned about the, their family members that were overseas, but also they had some, you know, bad news sometimes. People did not make it or they heard somebody, a neighbor of theirs, their, their husband died. So they really needed something and some of them 
Glenn Miller was very popular in the mood. I talked about Duke Ellington and Take the A Train and the Andrews Sisters, they're the ones that sang Boogie Boogie Bugle Boy, Sentimental Journey, You Made Me Love You, and Kitty Callan. It's been a long, long time. Now, this is somebody that's very, very special, and I'll talk to you a little bit later about that also, but there was a poem written by Hans Leap in 1915, a school teacher from Hamburg, Journey, Germany. Uh, Leap combined the name of his friend's name, Lily, with another friend, Marlene. So Hans Leap wrote this poem about Lily Marlene. The original German lyrics title was The Girl Under the Lamplight. It's a song of a young soldier during watch and his longing for for his girlfriend. This song caught the public's imagination. So remember, it was originally Lily Marlene was a poem. And then Leap combined the name again, Lily Marlene, that's how he came up with it. And the original German lyrics, the girl under the lamplight, which changed the flavor of the song because I, I recommend that you go on YouTube and look up Lily Marlene. The first thing that you will see um, on some of the YouTubes, you're going to see a girl leaning up against a lamppost and a soldier looking at them. And it's just an endearing look. They're not hugging. They're not, they're just looking at one another. And this is what the song is about. And that's why the original lyrics, The Girl Under the Lamplight, was written. Radio Belgrade was a radio station with transmission throughout Europe, including Germany and the Mediterranean. The station had to search for old or secondhand records to play for the station. Among the old, old records was a song, Lily Marlene, sung by Lael Anderson. The German station played that song frequently as they had so few records to share. So I would say maybe half, every half hour, every hour, whenever the radio station was on, one of the songs that they sang, that they played was Lily Marlene. At one point, the government propaganda station minister ordered the broadcasting of the song to be stopped. Why? People were enjoying it. They had hope when they listened to that song and they did not want anyone to have hope. They wanted to win the war. With such disappointment, soldiers from all over Europe asking them to play the song as it gave them hope that they would once meet again with family and lost loves. The song was then published in a wartime leaflet in English and that became the theme song of the 8th Army and the 6th Armored Division. So this song started out by a poem, it was a poem, and then it was translated into a song and people just were we're starving to hear Lily Marlene. And again, if you go on YouTube, just put in Lily Marlene. And I suggest that you do the, um, the to request um, that you're, you, that you want to Lily Marlene by Marlena Dietrich, because that's the one that is just so wonderful. And, uh, but that was a song that became so popular in the war. And again, you also see uh, oftentimes so many soldiers just listening uh, to Lily and Marlene together, maybe a thousand at a time. And that was all done by Marlene and Dietrich. Leo Anderson was awarded a gold disc for over 1 million sales. Now that, think of that in the day. Many allied soldiers made a point of listening to the song at the end of every day. It affected soldiers listening to the sensuous, nostalgic, sugar sweet voice of Marlene and Dietrich. Many people sang Lily Marlene, but she was the one that sang it the most. The single side of the record was produced by Decca Records. Marlene Dietrich's version, and this is what she said. Now here is a song that is very close to my heart. I sang it during the war. I sang it for three long years, all through Africa, Sicily, Italy, to Alaska, Greenland and Iceland and to England, through France, through Belgium, to Germany, and to Czechoslovakia. The soldiers loved Lily Marlene. Again, YouTube, Lily Marlene, sung by Marlene District, most popular song ever written. 
hit the music charts, 1944 through 1968. Again, 1981 to 1986. It was translated in more than 48 languages in English and German and Japanese, Italian, French, Hebrew, Russian, and on and on. And I bring this up because remember, we didn't have you know, TV to say, listen to Lily Marlene. People just by word of mouth knew that this was the song that would just move them forward in the uh, process of the war. A story told. I'm going to say something about the US Dorchester and the four chaplains. It's really an unusual story if you've not heard about it. I really didn't know too much about it until um, I was doing the research. Uh, my husband was in, um, was in the army and his dad was in the army during World War II. And he was in the submarine and he just really never, he was in the submarine force. He never came home until the war was over. And he has many stories to tell. But one of the stories that he also mentioned to my husband was something about a chapel that people really were donating money to uh, because it was part of the war's history. And so I thought I would add it because um, it, it's so interesting. The Dorchester, the US Dorchester, the ship was commissioned as SS Dorchester on March 20th, 1926. It was a cruise ship with a route to Miami and Boston. Then due to the war, the ship was converted and stripped of all luxuries as a transport ship for troops. Now you have to remember this was um, in 1926, it was a cruise ship. It had elaborate, elaborate uh, rooms, ballrooms, dancing rooms, uh, wonderful uh, dining facilities. And because they were so short of ships, they converted this to, in 1926 to a warship. It could carry 750 troops with 130 crew and 23 Navy armed guards. Well, just think about it. The Dorchester was not a warship. So it was not probably um, the most safe ship to be on during the war, but they needed um, they used it for transportation. In the early morning hours of February 3rd, 1943, the ship USAT George Dorchester was located in the notably freezing waters of the North Atlantic. Again, the ship was full. The ship's captain, Hans Danielson, knew he was in dangerous waters, but ordered his men to go to sleep now for a rough early morning destination 150 miles to safety. So they didn't want to continue during the night because of not being safe. They wanted to see. So they, he said, just go to sleep and we'll start again to, our, to safety, 150 miles. The order presented to his men to go to sleep in your clothing with life jackets on. Well, unfortunately, Hans Danielson, the captain, didn't realize that the men, half of them were already asleep. Most men disregarded the order as they were already asleep in the ship's hold and or the heat of the engine was unbearable and the life jackets were so uncomfortable. So he was thinking when he gave this order that people were going to go to sleep so that they could wake up early and start traveling to safety, but put your clothing and sleep with your clothing and life jackets on. Well, obviously that did not happen. The men were, half of them were already asleep. And in those very, very um, unbearable heat, the life jackets were so uncomfortable, that didn't happen either. At 12.55 AM, a German submarine spotted the Dorchester. The order was given to fire a fan of torpedoes to the Dorchester. One hit the starboard side far below the waterline. Captain Danielson knew the ship was rapidly sinking and gave the order to abandon ship. The blast had killed many men and many more seriously injured. There was chaos everywhere. Many men still sleeping without clothing knew they were doomed. They were awakened by their commander's uh, response to, you know, wake up, wake up. Many men sleeping, clothing, without clothing, they were doomed. There was confusion and panic on board. Men jumped into overcrowded lifeboats. Rafts were sent down, but floated away rapidly. 
The waters were freezing cold. The waters were choppy. Those who could jumped into the freezing waters because they knew the boat was going down the way it was hit. So they couldn't stay on board. The rafts floated away. The water was so choppy and a few men were able um, to get on those sh little ships. The four chaplains. This story starts when, as witnessed by Michael Warish, who was the first sergeant and other survivors, they noted the calmness and courageous selfless acts of heroism by the chaplains assigned to the Dorchester. They helped to distribute life preservers, assisted men to abandon ship and prayed for all. Once the chaplains entered the freezing waters with continued prayers, they gave, gave up their life preservers in their last and final act of courage. The story of the four chaplains were a Catholic, a Jew and two Protestants stand out among the many countless stories of commitment and bravery during the war. Their names were John P. Washington, Alexander D. Good, George L. Fox, and Clark B. Poling. Each wanted to serve God by ministering to men in the battlefield. The four chaplains received the Purple Heart and Distinguished Service Award. On the issue with the four chaplains, they all thought when they signed up and they were the four chaplains were together, they didn't know each other before, different denominations, but they thought they were going to be on a warship to help soldiers, to bring them through the nights and pray with them. But they were so shocked that they were on a transport trip. They were shocked and a little bit saddened, but they were there and they were going to do as directed. They never thought anything like this was going to happen. They created a stamp of the four chaplains. Um, it, these immortal chaplains, interfaith in action, and notice the stamps in the day were three cents. So you can buy these stamps, uh, ordering them online. Um, and we did buy uh, the book. There's a book about the four chaplains and um, we bought the stamp and that's a picture from the stamp from our home. Our country's commitment, the United States Postal Service issued a commemorative stamp in their honor. And there is a chapel of the four chaplains located in Philadelphia, 1201 Constitution Avenue, Philadelphia, 19112. But there are so many stories of strength and valor about the, the four chaplains. So many stories of the support by the home front, such happier and safer times did follow the commitment of the four chaplains was in everyone's memory. The chapel today, the chapel was built in 1942 at the former Navy shipyard, is special as it promotes the legacy of these four brave and reverend men and brothers in arms. Across the country, there are more than 300 memorials, plaques and statues dedicated to the memory of the four chaplains. On the Dorchester that day, 672 soldiers were killed, 902 that day, 672 were killed of the 902 soldiers, merchant seamen and civilian workers. So when that went down, uh, almost two thirds of the ship people died. Dedicated on February 3rd, 1951, President Harry Truman dedicated an interfaith shrine and memorial to the four chaplains to the four chaplains at Temple University in Philadelphia. So years after the war, their story was told and told and told. And President Harry Truman wanted to dedicate a memorial to these chaplains. His message was all races and faiths, all colors and economic degrees, living together and working together as American all. The chapel was eventually moved to two, moved two times to accommodate financial issues. So they started at Temple University. The Navy Yard is the permanent place for the interfaith chapel today. The saved treasures of the chapel were then put on display. The American Legion is one of the biggest chapel supporters. The vision is to keep the chaplain's memory alive. And they say brotherhood, cooperation, and service before self. So this chapel, again, it's throughout the United States because these four chaplains 
were so brave and everyone thought these four men of different faiths, how could they absolutely do something like this? And may, gave their life jackets, stayed in the water, prayed with men that were dying. It is now in memory at so many different places. Well, as I said, 300. Now I have just some uh, pictures about the uh, Philadelphia Inquirer. Uh, this says the Nazi surrender and European war. This was the late city edition. And you could re just think about this. You know, we had 24 news, people didn't know what was happening. So they would have two different, the newspapers in the Philadelphia area. And they would, one was the early morning and then we would have a late news. And this is how they got all of their news. The next one is peace. Truman announced, announces Jap surrender, ends fighting. MacArthur named chief, draft calls are slashed. So the, again, everybody would read the paper, listen to the newspaper, but just think how challenging all of this was. Rosie the Riveter. Well, this is a post of Rosie the Riveter and she made, she made, she was uh, the, the women's movement. Women, once the war started, they went into uh, working as, as whatever they needed to do. And Rosie the Riveter had the name because that's what she did. She had to help to support the war and she became well known. Rosie the Riveter is really a unique um, person. Again, you could read more about her on YouTube, but I just think she's fascinating because she was named because she thought nothing about going to work. She was a housewife, and but she had her mother taking care of her kids because she wanted to support that uh, that our service and she did it willingly, but she had followers. All women went into um, the workforce because they know that they needed, boy, their husbands couldn't do it, their brothers, their uncles, they couldn't do it, we can do it. So she was probably one of the first women's liber of the uh, country. Well, I wanna thank you all for listening. Now I'm sure we're gonna have questions. And I, again, will say, try to get on um, Lily Marlene and listen to her by Marlena Dietrich. And you'll listen to that um, feeling of love just coming from her voice and the way she sang it. So do uh, try to listen to Lily Marlene. She, it's really a, a good something to, a song to listen to. So are there any questions about what I've talked about? You can use the I, microphone in the lower left corner of your screen. If you just click it, it'll unmute yourself and you can unmute and ask questions. You can also turn on your camera if you're interested. I think when I do this program, I have done it during COVID. And I do, every time I um, think about it and every time I share this, I think about the differences in our, in our country today. And I don't, I'm not negative about it. It's a different, it's just a different time. But just think about World War II and how the home front was so uniquely important to what happened overseas and the support that was given, not only physically, but emotionally. And then I do think about the protests and all the things that uh, we really cannot manage in today's, in our society today. So um, it, it's just, I think it's sometimes it's a good time to reflect back on what life was like even during very trying times. Okay, well, I'm coming back in February and I believe I'm doing uh, for all of you that would like to uh, tune in uh, medication management. And, um, you know, as we age, we have all these different bottles, you know, some continued, discontinued, uh, but we're gonna talk about medication management. Yes, now, all right, Leah. Okay. Okay, hey, um, I have a couple things in the chat uh, for you. Not really a question, just um, uh, some comments. I got to thank you so very much. Very interesting. Uh, also, Ted says, thank you so much. My aunt, age 95, worked at an airplane factory. <laughs> that's great. Uh, right. Martins. So that's quite interesting. Um, thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. And thank you so much for being with us. 
uh, today, Jerry. I really appreciate it. This was very interesting. Um, uh, for those of you who, who joined us, if you have a friend or someone who you think might enjoy watching this presentation, it will also be available um, on our website um, starting next week. So I'll, I'll post it um, so people can, can watch it or uh, people who might miss it. There are some people who registered who didn't get to jump on today. So thank you again for being with us. This is really wonderful. Thank, thank you so much. I yeah, appreciate it. Thank you. Bye. Bye.